The views and opinions expressed on any programme are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the programme and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of FRC Media, Bristol Community College or the City of Fall River. Welcome everyone. I would like to welcome you to our inaugural lecture event for the LLC Lectures, which, um, whose purpose is to showcase the published works of our talented faculty and staff here at Bristol. I'm delighted to introduce our very first speaker, Dr. Eddie Gamon. He got his PhD in history from the University of Connecticut, and since 2021, he has been an assistant professor of history here at Bristol. He has been a fan of Lovecraft for many years now and recently had a chance to move 20 minutes outside of his hometown when the bridge isn't under construction. Mm. Right? That's a recent yeah. phenomenon. <laughs> um, he has had the chance to walk the same streets Lovecraft did, see his house and his grave. Um, all of this has contributed to the great joy and benefits of teaching here at Bristol. Without further ado, mm. Dr. Eddie Gamal. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so, yes, as mentioned now, Howard Phillips Lovecraft, H.P. Lovecraft, uh, was a or was at the time of his life not a very well-known author. Has become one since he died. He was born in Providence in 1890. Uh, he died in Providence in 1937. Spent most of his life in between in Providence with notable a two-year stint in New York City, which he did not like at all. So again, a guy was very oriented towards Providence. Uh, I, I will say there's not a whole, not, not a lot of romance in his life, although he was married even then, not a lot of romance in that short-lived marriage. But uh, he did play matchmakers. So I'll say he, uh, he had two writing, uh, two authorial friends, uh, uh, Henry Cutner and Catherine L. Moore, who did not know each other. He set them up, you know, he told them to look up each other through his letters to them, and they ended up getting married. So he did ultimately, you know, lead to a, a, a successful romantic match, just not with himself. Uh, uh, Lovecraft, you know, he's someone who's best known for a genre, uh, what we might, what he would call weird fiction, calls cosmic horror today. Uh, a sense, you know, during his time, a lot of the kind of typical horror, again, you know, he, it's living at the time of uh, Frankenstein, Dracula, beliefs in ghosts, mummies were very popular at the time. His view of horror was that you know, the real horror is not monsters that you might say, though there are monsters in his stories, but contemplating uh, the vastness of the universe, both in time and uh, uh, space. He lived in an era, which I'll cover a bit later on, when the human conception of the universe was, I mean, to use a word, dramatically expanding both, again, in time and in space. And he thought that one of the most terrifying things to consider, you know, wasn't a monster coming to attack you, although that is in most of his stories, but just contemplating how, you know, a single human in the universe was something that would basically be inconsequential and in trying to come to terms with the meaninglessness of the universe compared to a, uh, or meaninglessness of a human compared to the cosmic scale. And so as mentioned, I've been a fan of Lovecraft for a long time. A lot of his writings are centered in uh, Rhode Island. Actually, even though he's from Providence, most of his writings are actually in a uh, uh, number of fictional towns in Massachusetts. Uh, I'm from Connecticut. He didn't have a lot to write about in Connecticut, although there are some connections uh, there. And actually, his connections to Connecticut slight as they are, is actually how this book came about. So uh, I had been working on an article, which never really came together at some point, it might, on Lovecraft and his time in Connecticut. Uh, I, well, I'll mention uh, uh, his unsuccessful marriage. Last time he saw his wife was when they visited Hartford together, and then they split and never saw each other again. So Connecticut did play a certain role in his life. Uh, but uh, uh, I was contacted by my co-author, Horace Smith, who's a, uh, now an emeritus professor of astronomy at Michigan State University, who had been doing a lot of research on Lovecraft's connections with astronomy uh, as a field. I'd been very interested in Lovecraft and his connections to uh, the genre we, uh, at the time, was referred to as space opera, what we would consider, you know, science fiction, I think, generally now, like stuff like spaceships flying around and you know, going to other planets, meeting aliens, which in the 1920s and 30s is a very new genre. Lovecraft is not generally associated a lot with that, although he does have some connections. So I've been working on something like that as well. 
uh, Horace, who is from Connecticut, got in touch with me because he is looking into uh, research on Lovecraft and his connections with an observatory in Connecticut, which I'll cover in a few minutes. Uh, so, you know, we got to talking and we ended up, you know, sharing our ideas. His idea was to write a straight book on Lovecraft and astronomy. Mine was to look at Lovecraft and, you know, the genre of space opera in the 1920s and 30s. And, you know, we decided we should combine our efforts. And from that, this book was formed. That was over four years ago now. So it's a, it's a long process. But uh, again, uh, I will say, you know, I have a copy of the book here. I can buy it on Amazon if you're interested. Uh, I also say if you happen to uh, be willing to brave going into Providence over the bridge, uh, the Lovecraft Arts and Science Council downtown in Providence, uh, uh, you know, it's a store mainly focused on Lovecraft. They have a lot of other uh, genre stuff as well. You can buy physical copies of the book there. Probably the only bookstore in the United States or probably even the world that does have physical copies. So uh, if you're interested, you can go and check that out. Uh, I think they still have some of the signed copies there too. So it uh, could be, you know, very successful. Uh, so, uh, you know, if, it, if the book becomes popular, you can resell it later on. But uh, in any case... Uh, I'm going to cover just kind of some of the details from this book. Not you know, too many altogether, can't cover everything, uh, but I'll cover some of what I think are kind of the, the more interesting bits and we'll have time for a question and answer at the end. So hopefully this will be of interest, even if some of you may not be Lovecraft fans or so out of interest. Has any of you, or have anyone, has anyone here read any works by Lovecraft or familiar with him? You got a, a few, so, so, yeah. So he is a... a a guy who, during his lifetime, very much not a popular figure at all. Actually, he died of cancer. He kept a journal, basically keeping track of his uh, uh, cancer symptoms as he died. When, after he died, the New York Times published like a little like story saying like Providence author you know keeps track of his own death. That was basically the widest exposure he had. I was gonna say in his lifetime. Technically, it's after his, but so the fact that he died kind of was the biggest news. But over the years, he's become more and more popular. Uh, Stephen King, Neil Gaiman, Guillermo del Toro, uh, these are all people who are very big fans, have cited him as inspiration. And so he is a strange case of someone who is almost completely unknown in his life, is now recognized as an enormous figure. Uh, and partly it's because of uh, the voluminous letters he wrote. Uh, he is the most prolific uh, English language letter writer. Uh, if you look at letter writers of every language, only Voltaire wrote more. Uh, to give you an example, you know, another major figure of 20th century genre literature, uh, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. We have around 500 letters that Tolkien wrote in his lifetime that still exist. We have almost 100,000 letters that Lovecraft wrote in his lifetime over the span. And again, he died at the age of 46. It's not a long lifetime either. Uh, people have pointed out if he had spent less time writing letters, he probably could have been more successful and more popular. And I mean, that, that is a, a genuine criticism. Uh, the other, uh, he, has a, he had a very good aptitude for self-sabotage also. Again, kind of also a good warning sign there. But thanks to his letter, he wrote on every subject to every sort of person, uh, to complete strangers, you know, to his relatives. Uh, uh, you know, again, since it's Valentine's Day, I'll point out after he died, his wife burned most of their letters to each other. So that also may be a, a bit of a hint as to the relationship between them. Uh, but we therefore know, like, we know details about his life that we know about almost none of his even more famous contemporaries in the 20th century. And so we're able to kind of extrapolate a lot out of uh, his lifetime from that. And so we're able to get kind of a very good view of his interests. And as it turns out, one of the core interests in his life was astronomy. And an example of this comes from a very young age. Lovecraft was always interested in science, but for him, science essentially meant astronomy. Uh, there's a collected uh, volume of his writings on science uh, from Hippocampus Press, if you're interested. Almost all of his science writings are astronomy writings. And so, again, his interest in science, the scientific world, is basically his interest of, again, the connections of humans and uh, other worlds, other places in the universe. Uh, again, I mentioned he writes a lot of letters. One of his letters, he says that in his lifetime as a child, uh, he was very depressed. He contemplated suicide. But the interest in science, you know, of uh, discovering things about other stars, other universes, is one of the things he says prevented him from actually committing suicide as a child. So astronomy was very notable in his life. Uh, 
he self-published you know, as a precocious teenager a journal of astronomy called the Rhode Island Journal of Astronomy. Uh, mainly it was uh, from 1903 to 1907, so when he was 13 to 17 years old. Uh, if you're interested, Brown University, they have scanned and digitized all the copies of this journal. So you can go see every bit of you know, Lovecraft's uh, teenage writings on astronomy there. Uh, but he's not only just self-publishing these journals, and it's not really clear who the client, who, who was actually reading this. Uh, probably it was mainly his friends and family, but you know, again, he is you know, writing a lot of this. Uh, and it's not only just for himself. From 1906, he wrote astronomy columns for two local newspapers, uh, the Patuxet Valley Gleaner and the Providence Tribune. Occasionally, he's recycling some of these uh, uh, amateur journal writings he wrote for professional publications. So again, they were of high enough quality to get published in newspapers. Uh, he mentions in one letter a story that uh, uh, when he was in high school, he had to do a science you know, assignment. He handed in an article on astronomy. Uh, his teacher claimed that he was a plagiarist, that he was copying from the newspaper. He had to bring in the newspaper to prove that he had actually written the article in the newspaper that she had read and claimed that he was plagiarizing. So again, you know, he's good enough that, we know at least some people are reading his uh, published uh, newspaper accounts. Uh, so that's from 1906 onward. From 1913 to 1918, he starts writing even longer astronomy columns for the Providence Evening News. And interestingly, uh, the Asheville Gazette News in North Carolina, it's not really clear how someone who, I don't you know, never really stopped in North Carolina during his life, certainly not by 1918. Uh, he did have a childhood friend that moved from Providence to Asheville, so that probably is the connection. But again, even in North Carolina, he's publishing in local newspapers these uh, uh, very extensive writings on astronomy. Uh, he's also engaged in kind of debates with pseudoscience at the time. Uh, he gets uh, involved in you know, claiming that you know people who think the Earth is hollow, which was a very popular idea at the time, were wrong. Uh, he's involved in debates with astrologers. Uh, he starts impersonating an astrologer and making these claims about how you know he's predicted that in the year like 5700 uh, that comets are going to hit the Earth and that the you know the last surviving humans are going to go to Venus and build shrines to, you know, uh, Johannes. So he's making all these, you know, uh, fantastical claims that he says is being, you know, justified by astrology, and all the astrologers he's debating aren't really sure, of, you know, how to respond to him. Uh, but uh, he's also, as I'll mention later, gets involved with what we would call UFOs. Uh, the term doesn't exist at the time, but it is. Uh, uh, something that he dabbles in in his writings, uh, and he's present at a UFO sighting as well. So again, notions of the fantastic are very prominent early on in his lifetime. Uh, he is also an early reader in science fiction. Uh, in his self-published journal, uh, one of his articles from 1903, it's titled, Can the Moon Be Reached by Man? This is notably a, a rare foray into what we might call you know, space flight speculation. Uh, this is inspired by an article he had read in the Muncie magazines called Can Men Visit the Moon? Uh, he read this article and you know, he had a lot of thoughts on it you know, as uh, based on his own uh, readings of science fact, but also science fiction. He's a very early uh, uh, reader of uh, Jules Verne in particular. Uh, uh, we can see here uh, on the left, we have this illustration of uh, 13-year-old Lovecraft about what a moon base would look like with a lunar observatory. Notably, he talked about how a, a space hotels were going to be a big concern. So again, an early predictor of space tourism. But he depicts here, he calls the lunar train going between Earth and the moon. If you look at this cover of Jules Verne's From the Earth to the Moon, you can see he's probably copying this version of a uh, the Verne cover with its own uh, lunar train on there as well. Uh, he also is a big reader of H.G. Wells, uh, notably not initially The War of the Worlds, but he did read From the Earth, or uh, The First Men in the Moon, another early uh, uh, space travel book by uh, uh, Wells. He also read, among other things, uh, John Jacob Astor's A Journey in Other Worlds. Uh, this is a book, a very early science fiction book, also notable because uh, John Jacob Astor, this is the same Astor of the uh, Waldorf Astoria Hotel, who will then become the uh, most uh, wealthy person to die in the Titanic. So he also wrote science fiction that Lovecraft owned. 
Uh, another figure that Lovecraft was very interested in, a science popularizer named Garrett P. Service, uh, who was basically a, something like the Carl Sagan of the uh, late 19th and early 20th centuries, who also dabbled in science fiction, which no one notable one which we'll talk about in a bit. But outside of science fiction, outside of the science uh, uh, fact publications, young Lovecraft did have one very early point of access to firsthand astronomical knowledge. And this is LAD uni or, uh, a LAD observatory at Brown University. Uh, have, has anyone been to LAD? About a 20 minute drive from here. Uh, they have open houses on Tuesdays, I think. So if you're ever interested, free on a Tuesday, you can go. They'll show you the observatory. I think you can look through the telescope still, too. Uh, Brown University uh, starts uh, constructing this in uh, 1889. It opens in 1891, notably you know, a year after Lovecraft himself is born. So there's a good overlap uh, there. Uh, this is not the first observatory in Rhode Island, but it's the first dedicated observatory by Brown University. Uh, when it's established as the largest telescope in Rhode Island, even though by national standards it's a fairly uh, a minor one. But even in the 1890s, there's not a lot of light pollution. Uh, in, uh, even in the heart of Providence, electric lights are much less prominent at the time. And so even an uh, observatory in Providence can still look very you know, deep into space, doesn't have to worry as much with uh, uh, light pollution as observatories today do. Uh, uh, even so, LAD, even though it's an uh, observatory, it's mainly has other functions as well. It's used as a local timekeeping uh, station. So, you know, if people in the neighborhood or you know in the city wanted to tune their clocks, right, they would call that observatory. Uh, it's a meteorological station and it's used as a uh, uh, classroom. I think for the physics department uh, initially, I think astronomy was not a major department at Brown at the time. Uh, and so, uh, this by the way, this photograph I found this in uh, the John Hay Library at Brown. This is a Brown, or this is Ladd Observatory at the start of the Spanish-American War in 1898. That's why they have the giant American flag overhead. So again, kind of an interesting little historical overlap there. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, in addition to housing a telescope, the Ladd Observatory also was used to teach classes. It had a well-stocked library with books, uh, had current astronomy journals that were collected there. This photograph is somewhere between 1891 and 1898. The main library, uh, if you go there today, it still looks generally the same. They have a few other things there. But again, the building itself hasn't changed a whole lot. I think last time I was there, that uh, painting of Saturn was still there. So again, a lot of this. So even though LAD is not a major observatory by national standards, it has up-to-date uh, uh, cutting-edge scientific journals coming in, scientific publications. The lab library is open to the public, uh, and it's a library. You can actually take out books from this. Uh, Lovecraft, as a child, did go to the lab library, and this is where I'm very proud of this. He writes in his letters about how he had you know, gone to the library, how he took out books. No one had ever really figured out uh, what exact books he was you know, taking care of uh, or what he was taking out. Uh, Again, Brown has a very large collection of Lovecraft materials in their uh, John Hay Library. Uh, it's not mentioned in any of those, but when I was looking through uh, the John Hay archives a few years ago, looking through the Department of Astronomy records in the Ladd Library, I did come across the actual uh, Ladd Library uh, account book from the early 1900s, uh, and I found young Lovecraft in you know, three of these sections. Uh, so we know in uh, late 1906, he took out Robert Wheeler's laboratory astronomy textbook. Early 1907, he took out an 1878 textbook called How to Work with the Spectroscope. That's a device that helps you uh, analyze what elements are in uh, you know, a comet or a star. And then in uh, the middle of 1907, he took out a book called The Planet Mars by uh, one of the most popular astronomers in the US at the time, Willie. William Henry Pickering. The interesting thing is uh, there's not a book called The Planet Mars by Pickering, so I'm not exactly clear what it was. I think this was a translation of a uh, 1894 book by an Italian astronomer, Giovanni Scaparelli, which I'll come back to in a moment. Uh, Scaparelli, again, very popular in uh, Providence because of its large Italian population, mm -hmm. uh, because of a certain claim that Scaparelli made about Mars. I'll discuss in a 
few minutes. So we know Lovecraft at least took out these three books from the Ladd Library. Uh, he read a lot of other ones there, but I can, I'm proud to say this is the contribution I made to Lovecraft uh, studies of actually finding out this. You know, in the 2020s, finding out new stuff about Lovecraft is not that common. So I'm glad about that. Um, now, again, Lovecraft is a teenager at this time. He has no institutional affiliations with Brown University. Lovecraft ends up not even graduating high school. Uh, so again, he's essentially, he's a high school dropout with no connection to Brown University, no academic you know, standing of his own. Why is this kid you know, being tolerated by the astronomers at Ladd Observatory? The likely connection is this man, Winslow Upton. He's the first director of Ladd Observatory. Uh, he was a friend of a man named Franklin Chase Clark, who was the husband of Lovecraft's Aunt Lillian. So through this family connection, the young Lovecraft came to Upton's uh, attention. Upton gave him kind of the free reign. Upton and his two uh, uh, assistants at the time, again, the entire astronomy department are these three guys who are also running uh, the observatory. Uh, they basically, you know, uh, introduced Lovecraft to a lot of astronomical knowledge, you know, helped him with a lot of stuff. They're responsible for a lot of the details Lovecraft picks up for his writing. Uh, Upton also wrote the astronomy column for what was then and still is the main Rhode Island newspaper, the Providence Journal. This is probably A, why Lovecraft got into writing astronomy journal or astronomy columns for newspapers and why he had to go to kind of the second rate papers because Upton had first claim. Uh, now, if any of you happen to go walking around Providence, you know, it's a pretty city, uh, directly east of uh, Ladd Observatory, you're going to come across Upton Avenue. So again, a direct connection with uh, Upton, the astronomer there. I'll say also, uh, some of you may know, the book I'm currently working on is a, uh, uh, a history of the Flat Earth Movement. Upton's daughter, who lived in Boston, by apparently complete coincidence, got involved with a number of the flat earthers in Boston in the early 1900s. Happy to talk more about that in the question and answer, but it was funny to see kind of those two uh, you know, collisions of the same, uh, the same family coming into these two different realms of study. Uh, now, if you are walking around uh, you know, Providence you know, for a day when it gets warmer and sunnier out, two other interesting street names you might come across, uh, Planet Street and Transit Street. So, in the year 1769, uh, the planet Venus passed in front of the sun in what is called a transit. Uh, there is a local self-taught mathematician in Providence named Benjamin West. Uh, West observed the transit uh, from Providence using what is believed to be the first uh, uh, telescope, at least the first known telescope in Rhode Island. Uh, uh, probably he imported it from London. Uh, if you uh, it used, this telescope used to be on display in the John Hay Library, so if you ever walk in, you can see this, you know, 250-year-old telescope there. It's not huge, uh, but it's a, uh, uh, a decent-sized one. So Benjamin West observed Venus using the first telescope in Rhode Island. Uh, he wrote a pamphlet about this observation. Uh, this pamphlet got published in the American Philosophical Society in uh, Philadelphia and by the Royal Society in London, because Rhode Island still a colony at the time. Uh, this you know, gave uh, Benjamin West such high regard, the fact he wrote this pamphlet that got reprinted by the Royal Society in London. Uh, West, just by writing this, he was given a doctorate by Brown University. He went on to become a mathematics professor. So again, uh, a very different standard for you know, higher education at the time. But to give you a sense of just how important astronomy was, the fact that uh, Benjamin West you know, wrote, he made this important astronomical observation of Venus. At the time, uh, Newport, still the capital of Rhode Island, but Providence was kind of in its ascendancy. This is one of the things that kind of tilted the balance of uh, you know, power towards Providence from Newport. So again, this has you know, major political connotations as well in uh, what will be quickly become the state of Rhode Island. Uh, and so the city of Providence names these two streets after a uh, uh, West's observation of the planet. Uh, notably, uh, a transit street, this runs parallel half a mile south to where Lovecraft lived on Angel Street. So undoubtedly, he wandered back and forth and you know, saw this street as well. Uh, now, another figure at Ladd Observatory, uh, Frederick Slocum, who is one of the uh, 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 main assistants here, uh, 
in one of in Lovecraft's longest and is what he says is his favorite novel, The Case of Charles Dexter Ward. He has a minor character named Charles Slocum, maybe named after uh, this guy, but again, uh, one of the people who Lovecraft writes about knowing. Uh, the other uh, kind of major figure is a, a guy named John William Edwards. Uh, Slocum and Edwards, after Lovecraft kind of stops attending Lad Observatory, uh, they go to Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut, and they establish Van Vleck Observatory at that university. So again, these two astronomers who helped set up the Brown Observatory then go to uh, you know, Connecticut, set up this other university uh, observatory. Uh, by coincidence, uh, the Van Vleck Observatory in Middletown, this is half a mile from an Episcopal church where Lovecraft had another friend and occasional co-writer, Henry S. Whitehead, uh, who was the Episcopal rector of that church. So by complete coincidence, you know, Lovecraft has these three people who he knows living you know, in close proximity to each other. Uh, Henry Whitehead, who was this Episcopal rector, uh, he wrote kind of Caribbean-themed horror stories, one of the first people to write about zombies in the English language, uh, using the term zombies. Uh, so, And he went on to become, I think, it was a, uh, the Archbishop of the U.S. Virgin Islands. So again, a, a fairly well-known person as well. Uh, and he was a classmate of uh, Franklin Roosevelt's at Harvard. Uh, and so again, a good case study of how Lovecraft has these occasional brushes with, you know, uh, people of importance, but kind of isn't able to capitalize on them all that much. Uh, now, one other thing I'll bring up about Lad Observatories, in one of Lovecraft's last big uh, novels, uh, The Whisperer in Darkness, uh, which is also, as we'll come back to say, one of the first appearances of the planet Pluto, or the ex-planet Pluto in fiction, uh, Lovecraft's aliens in these stories, the Mego, uh, they you know, take people's brains out of their bodies and put them into these giant metal cylinders to travel across uh, space to other planets. So again, giant you know, metal cylinders connected with traveling you know, between stars. At Lad Observatory, uh, they have these timekeeping equipments, clocks that are stabilized by these giant metal cylinders. So again, it seems you know, likely, at least, this may have been one of the inspirations for one of Lovecraft's later works of fiction. Uh, now, uh, speaking of you know, Pluto, we'll come back to that. Pluto is partially named after an astronomer named Percival Lowell, his two initials, PL. Uh, Percival Lowell kind of led the search for Pluto. It's only discovered after he died. Lowell is kind of uh, trying to gain res respectability after a, f a different uh, attempt of observing a nearby planet. Uh, this was the efforts to observe Mars and his belief in Martian canals. Uh, Giovanni Schiaparelli, the Italian astronomer I mentioned before, in 1877, Schiaparelli announces that he has observed what he claims are uh, canali on the surface of Mars. Uh, Canali is an Italian word that means channels. Scaparelli meant that he thought he was observing kind of like the runoff channels from uh, the uh, polar ice caps on Mars melting. In English, canali got mistranslated as canals, meaning an artificial waterway. And so Scaparelli thought he had just been finding, you know, kind of like runoff rivers on Mars. This gets translated into the English language press that Scaparelli has discovered that Martians are constructing giant artificial waterways on Mars to preserve their dying planet. And so this leads to this enormous uh, fad, the belief that Martians are real and they are building enormous canals across the surface of their planet to preserve it from dying. This is an echo of what at the time is called the nebular hypothesis, the idea that the solar system is formed kind of from the outside in that, you know, millions of years ago, I don't think they'd really conceptualized the billions of years yet, that the primeval nebula was, you know, red hot, it slowly condensed outward in, so the outer planets are older than the inner planets. So Mars is a much older planet than Earth in this uh, cosmology, which means Mars is closer to dying, but it also means the life on Mars has to be more advanced than the life on Earth. So. This is a worldview, a literal worldview, where you have Mars full of these ancient, you know, highly advanced aliens who are trying to, you know, keep their uh, planet, you know, hold it together, stop the, you know, the inevitable approach of natural extinction as their uh, 
environment collapses. These are themes that you can see might be of interest to Lovecraft, who's very interested in you know, the, the futility of holding out against uh, uh, you know, the onrush of you know, uh, uh, implacable natural forces, uh, both temporal, geological, spatial. So themes that very much echo with Lovecraft. Uh, and notably, Lowell himself, well, I say Lovecraft did eventually meet Lowell. Uh, in 1907, Lowell gives a talk at Brown University. Professor Upton, the astronomer, introduces young Lovecraft to Lowell. Uh, Lowell you know, had been the subject of a number of Lovecraft's writings in both his own journal and in his published newspaper columns. Uh, Lovecraft later on claims that you know, he, didn't, he never thought that you know, the idea of Martian canals was true, but if you read his articles, he, he definitely gives it uh, credence. Uh, he writes a, uh, an elegiac poem to Lowell after Lowell dies in 1916. So again, Lovecraft was very influenced. And you know, this is uh, Lovecraft's attempts to draw his map of Mars uh, in his journal. This is, I believe, the only color illustration in his journal. So again, gives some kind of a, you know, prominence as well. Uh, now, Lowell's idea of you know, a uh, Mars that was very ancient, uh, you know, full of uh, dying uh, uh, Martians, you know, s you know, jealous of the Earth and all of our you know, youthful water on our planet, uh, this is very influential to science fiction authors. Uh, in particular, uh, H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds, very much influenced uh, by Percival Lowell's speculation. Again, you know, for those who aren't interested, this is kind of the first alien invasion story. The Martians are jealous that you know, humans have such a great planet. They cross you know, from Mars to try and invade Earth. Uh, ultimately, because the Martians are so advanced, They've gotten rid of sickness on their planet, which means they don't have any immune systems, which means they die from the common cold eventually when they come to Earth. Uh, Wells was very interested in evolutionary theories at the time. He comes up with the idea that uh, you know, the advanced Martians wouldn't look like humans. They would look like cephalopods, uh, you know, giant octopus-like creatures. Notably, uh, Lovecraft, when he writes uh, in 1926, The Call of Cthulhu, probably his most famous work. Uh, his One of the aliens in that story, Cthulhu, is very octopus-like, uh, very similar, to, again, to the Wellsian depiction of the Martians. Uh, in The Call of Cthulhu, there's a scene where uh, Cthulhu lives in the ocean, or he, he's now established in the ocean after coming to Earth. Sailors on a boat ram Cthulhu. This is you know, very similar to a scene in The War of the Worlds itself. Uh, the War of the Worlds also has a scene where uh, you know, the Martians destroy a giant uh, church in London when they invade. Lovecraft writes about having this dream about an invading force coming from space to Providence uh, to attack the Baptist church in Providence, uh, which is still there. You can still see it. So clearly there's a lot of uh, uh, parallels between Lovecraft and the War of the Worlds, I don't think is coincidental. And a lot of the themes of, you know, uh, trying to escape the onroach of destruction from the natural world echoed by Lovecraft as well. Uh, now, Lovecraft, not the only person influenced by the War of the Worlds. Uh, copyright laws in the 1890s are not what they are here. So you have a lot of uh, what we might call, uh, uh, I guess, unauthorized uh, sequels, unauthorized rewrites that happen in the U.S., because again, no one in the U.S. is that interested in British copyright. So there's, a, for example, I think there's a, a book called The War of the Worlds in Boston, which again is basically just, they took the text of The War of the Worlds, replaced London with Boston. There's one set in New York, but there's one kind of more creative one as well called Edison's Conquest of Mars by Garrett Service, uh, the science popularizer whom Lovecraft was very fond of. Edison's Conquest of Mars is, is exactly what it sounds like that it's a sequel to the War of the Worlds where Thomas Edison, the great inventor, builds a fleet of spaceships uh, that, you know, Americans can go to Mars. And uh, I mean, the ending is they commit genocide against the Martians. Note, this is published during the Spanish-American War as well, which I think there is some clear, there's a lot of political overtones there that, you know, I think are somewhat obvious, you know, the U.S. creating a giant fleet to go, uh, you know, invade other people. Uh, but uh, in, this book, Edison's Conquest of Mars, among other things, 
uh, they find that you know, uh, there are these ruins of giant alien structures on the moon. Uh, and when they go to Mars, they find that the Martians have invaded Earth in the distant past that the Martians have kidnapped humans, brought them to Mars, but also that uh, the Sphinx, the pyramids of Egypt were built as temples to the Martians. The Sphinx is actually uh, supposed to be the ancient Martian uh, that gets worshiped as a god by the ancient Egyptians. This is kind of like the origin of the ancient aliens trope that is, uh, uh, you know, if you watch the History Channel, you can't escape me, is what passes for history on the History Channel now. So, again, this is really is the origin of it. Uh, and among other, like, this is also one of the first depictions of a spacesuit in fiction, uh, a ray gun, one of the first uh, space battles in fiction. So, for like, a, a very cheap, you know, copyright infringing knockoff of the War of the Worlds, this actually is a very significant work of science fiction. But, again, you can see it's influential in Lovecraft. For Lovecraft, all of the gods, all the creatures he talks about aren't, like, re quote, real gods. They're aliens who had come to Earth in the past. You know, Cthulhu is worshipped as a god, but it's it's an alien creature. Uh, so again, a lot of these tropes that become very standard elements of Lovecraft's writing uh, are clear, probably stuff he absorbed from Garrett P. Service in Edison's Conquest of Mars. Uh, now, Service, when he writes this, the reason he chooses Edison is because at the time, there is this trope that uh, uh, you know, people like Thomas, as you know, the great American inventors, uh, are you know, designing fantastic flying machines of their own. Uh, you know, this is a few years before uh, the Wright brothers' first flight at Kitty Hawk. And so everywhere in the newspapers, there are people claiming you know, to be some inventor who's built a flying machine for the first time. And Edison himself was the subject of a number of these claims that, uh, you know, this you know, fantastic flying device had been created. This is also coming several years, I mean, literally less than a year after the end of the first major wave of what we would call UFO sightings. Uh, at the time, they're not called UFOs, they're called mystery airships or phantom airships. In the late 1890s, 1896 to 97, there's a wave of mystery airship sightings in the Midwest. Uh, these, these sightings from the 1890s are generally not associated with aliens. Uh, a few of them are. There's actually one in Aurora, Texas that's very famous. Uh, the townspeople claim a Martian crashed his airship into the town, that they buried the alien in the town green. This is kind of one of the first like UFO crash stories that you know, 50 years later will become Roswell. But most of these UFO sightings at the time are, they think you know, they're American inventors who have just, you know, with you know, plucky American ingenuity, invented some fantastic airship that they can zip around. And even after the Wright brothers, there still uh, are these claimed sightings. Uh, that, that wave of the 1890s, that tends to be in the West and the Southwest. In late 1909, early 1910, there's a major wave that's right here in Southern New England. Uh, this is associated with a businessman from Worcester named Wallace Tillinghast, who claims that he's invented this airship and flown it around. Christmas Eve in 1909, Lovecraft is in downtown Providence uh, doing his Christmas shopping. He's in a crowd. All of a sudden, everyone in the crowd points up at the sky and says, you know, look at that light up there. You know, it's uh, the Tillinghast airship flying overhead. You know, look at it. And, you know, Lovecraft looks up and he says, it's the planet Venus. Uh, so again, you know, the, the typical, you know, debunking thing of, uh, you know, oh, it's just, it's not a UFO, it's Venus, and Lovecraft is right there from the start. He returns to this a lot in his letters as well. Uh, his uh, uh, short story, From Beyond, which gets turned into the 1986 movie by uh, Stuart Gordon, uh, the main villain of that is a mad scientist named Crawford Tillinghast. So again, you know, it's stuck with Lovecraft for a bit. Uh, notably, Lovecraft had a friend, a, a pen pal, we can say. He never met in person, uh, Clark Ashton Smith, who lived in California. In the 1920s, Clark Ashton Smith has what we would call you know, a genuine UFO encounter. He says, a giant you know, black cylinder flew overhead silently with red flashing lights. Lovecraft again says, oh, this is just a meteor or something that you saw. You know, It's not, a, not an alien, don't worry about it. But again, even in the 1920s, you know, people in Lovecraft circles are seeing uh, UFOs. Uh, now, interestingly, one of the main uh, journals that Lovecraft publishes his stories in is a journal called Weird Tales. A number of his stories are published in the same issue as uh, stories written by another man named Donald Kehoe. 
In the 1950s, Kehoe becomes one of the main UFO writers in the United States after the modern notion of the flying saucer emerges. So again, one of the people who most shapes our conception of things like, you know, flying saucers, UFO crashes, government cover-ups, is a guy who published stories with Lovecraft and absolutely read quite a lot of Lovecraft's work as well. Uh, whoops. Uh, now, other things associated in the, the sky overhead, Lovecraft is alive during the 1910 passage of Halley's Comet. Uh, this is a, a notable passage because at the time, people are convinced that you know, Halley's Comet will end all life on Earth, not because the comet's going to hit the Earth, but because the Earth will pass through the tail of the comet. Astronomers had discovered that the tails of comets contain traces of the gas cyanogen, uh, the belief that the Earth would pass through the tail of Halley's Comet, the cyanogen would kill all life on Earth. Pe there is a mass panic. People are buying uh, comet pills, or just sugar pills that are supposed to be antidotes. People were buying a gas mask. There are, you know, there's records of people committing suicide because they would rather die than you know suffocate with Halley's Comet. And obviously, nothing ended up happening. Uh, Lovecraft actually had, you know, he had a very bad case of the flu, I think. So he actually misses a lot of Halley's Comet. But this is actually, uh, uh, you know, one illustration he makes of not Halley's Comet, but a. Uh, 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 an earlier comet from 1910, the Great January Comet. Uh, to give you a sense of how mobile he was, even though Lovecraft lives in Providence, this is an illustration he does from an observing spot in Seekonk. He rode his bike from Providence to Seekonk just to illustrate Halley's Comet in you know, uh, good darkness. So again, if you're interested in what Seekonk in 1910 looked like, you know, this is it. Uh, other kind of interesting things that are happening in New England, and specifically Massachusetts, is the modern rocket as we know it today is developed. Now, rockets have existed for thousands of years, uh, or at least hundreds of years in China using gunpowder. Up until the 20th century, rockets all use solid fuel. This limits the size and the power of rockets that can be built. Modern rockets, you know, the rockets that you know, took astronauts to the moon, rockets that launch satellites that you know, we use for our communications, these are powered by liquid fuel liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, or some other element. Uh, and oftentimes, it's just kerosene that's used. These rockets trace themselves to this man, Robert Goddard, uh, who uh, was educated and worked at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, Goddard, in 1919, wrote a, uh, 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 a pamphlet, called, I think it's called A Method of Reaching Extreme Altitudes, which is a very uh, neutral title. The goal of that was saying if you built a liquid-fueled rocket large enough, you could reach the moon. Uh, this leads to a huge amount of ridicule. Uh, the New York Times runs an editorial saying that you know he's crazy, that everyone knows rockets can't actually work in space because there's no air for the rocket to push against, so therefore you can't have action and reaction. Uh, the New York Times printed a uh, retraction after the Apollo 11 landing in 1969. But again, for suggesting that you could build rockets to go into space, he's being ridiculed in the largest newspaper on Earth. Uh, he gets in, uh, on March 16th, 1926, Goddard launches the world's first liquid-fueled rocket from the Asa Ward farm in Auburn, Massachusetts. It's a golf course today, but if you go, there's a plaque in the middle of the golf course where he launches his rocket, oh, you can see it right there on the left. Uh, this is again, uh, the modern space age really traces itself back to here. Uh, notably, Goddard himself says he's influenced by reading Edison's Conquest of Mars, so it did have some use as well. Uh, this rocket's powered by liquid oxygen and gasoline. It flies a total distance of 184 feet, lands in a cabbage patch. So again, not a, very impressive, but it is the dawn of modern uh, rocketry. Uh, he keeps building bigger and bigger rockets, launching them in central Massachusetts. People end up getting kind of annoyed that this guy is you know, bombing their farm with rockets. Uh, so he ultimately gets a grant from the Guggenheim family, thanks to a association with Charles Lindbergh, the famous aviator. They get enough money for Goddard to relocate you know, to a place that they consider is very sleepy. No one's ever going to bother him. No one's going to ever care about this. Uh, this is the town of Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, so it, 
several years before you know the UFO involvement, Goddard's there launching rockets. Uh, he dies before the UFO crash that's there. But again, it is kind of one of those funny parallels themselves. Uh, Lovecraft himself, very interested in Goddard's work. In some of his letters, he talks about, uh, you know, to his friends, uh, want to talk about either the trans-Neptunian planet, a.k.a. the search for Pluto, communication with Venus, by which he means actually communicating with people on Venus, uh, and the plan of Robert Goddard's to send a rocket to the moon. Uh, and so, again, he's talking about this. Uh, much later, he writes to one of his co-authors, Kenneth Sterling, you know, I always realized that Goddard was a serious investigator. And then from what Lovecraft says is his, famous, uh, his uh, favorite story, The Color Out of Space, uh, he has this section, which is, this is a story also influenced by the War of the Worlds, about a meteorite crashing on a farm in central uh, Massachusetts. The meteorite basically you know, mutates the wildlife and eventually the farmers themselves. And the entity that's in the meteorite eventually uh, takes off and goes back into space. You know, he writes about, uh, you know, without warning, the hideous thing shot vertically up towards the sky like a rocket. This is the only reference to a rocket in any of Lovecraft's fiction. Uh, you know, the association of a rocket with a farm in central Massachusetts. He's publishing this during the time Lo uh, Goddard is launching his rockets from farms in central Massachusetts. It seems like definitely some overlap there. Uh, now, even though this is the only time Lovecraft writes about rockets, it's not the only time he writes about, uh, we'll say, other planets or journeying to other planets. Uh, in 1936, he, writes, he publishes a story, his last major story published before he dies, called In the Walls of Eryx, which is set on Venus. And today we know Venus you know, is a, not a nice place. It's covered with you know, sulfuric acid clouds. I think the temperature is something like 900 degrees on the surface. But the idea of Venus in the early 20th century is very different. Uh, when people looked at Venus through the telescope, it wasn't quite, quite clear that it was covered in clouds. There are people, you know, uh, Lowell himself is trying to map Venus, not just Mars. He says there are canals on Venus, uh, but people think they can see signs of you no know, giant forest fires on Venus. So there are people who think that life on Venus does exist. Again, if Mars is older than Earth, the idea is that Venus is actually younger than Earth. So life on Venus will be like life in the past, which means that Venus must be like you no know, Earth during the time of the dinosaurs. A lot of fiction has. Uh, Venus as this swampy world covered in dinosaur life. Uh, uh, Lovecraft, in his story, has a Venus populated by uh, spe a species he calls the man lizards. And this is an illustration that was done by a, uh, actually done by a paleontologist named Russell, Russell J. Hawley. He was kind enough to let us use it in our book, so this illustration is there. But again, kind of like a dinosaur with tentacles coming out of its chest. Uh, this is a very, you know, it's kind of like a proto-avatar story, because In the Walls of Eryx is about humans going to Venus to mine these precious uh, crystals from Venus. The crystals are worshipped by the uh, uh, man lizards. The man lizards you know, basically fight and kill the humans who go to mine Venus. The narrator of the story basically comes to the conclusion that, you know, maybe we should just let, leave Venus alone. Kind of a very, uh, an interesting, like, early anti-colonial, like, uh, space opera type story. And again, also interesting coming from uh, Lovecraft, who was not the biggest critic of colonialism in the real world. So, uh, again, uh, an interesting uh, introduction of that trope in science fiction. Uh, Ultimately, Lovecraft will say that he thinks that life on Venus is more likely than life on Mars, although probably the opposite ends up being true now. Uh, but again, this is kind of the one big entry into the genre that Lovecraft uh, uh, writes about. Uh, now, this comes after Lovecraft wrote a story he had uh, 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 already published called uh, The Whisperer in Darkness. I mentioned this before about uh, a guy who goes to upstate uh, Vermont and finds that this farm in upstate Vermont is being attacked by these creatures from the planet Yugoth. Uh, the planet Yugoth was a planet that Lovecraft had started writing about in the late 1920s. He starts writing The Whisperer in Darkness uh, in 1929. While he's writing this, and again, this is a story about uh, psychic aliens coming to Earth, by the way, from the planet Yugoth. Uh, there's an announcement that there's been a discovery of a new planet in the solar system, the planet Pluto. Uh, 
And uh, it's discovered by a guy named Clyde Tombag, uh, an astronomer at Lowell Observatory. Basically, after Percival Lowell had kind of been laughed out of respectable company for his ideas of life on Venus and Mars, he says, I'm going to find you know, the next planet outside of Venus. His observatory is where Pluto is eventually discovered. Uh, Clyde Tombag writes about how uh, he discovers Pluto because he says it's almost like you know, getting a signal into his brain. I mean, he knew where to look, and that's how he you know, realized it. So Lovecraft has been writing about you know, psychic aliens from uh, this undiscovered planet called Yugoth. And so at the end of you know, The Whisper in Darkness, as he's writing it, as it's happened, he basically says, oh, the planet Yugoth is actually Pluto. Uh, and you may also note that uh, uh, in 2015, uh, the space probe New Horizons went by Pluto. It's the first time that a, uh, uh, you know, a it's the first and only time a human spacecraft has gone by Pluto. Uh, some of Clyde Tombag's ashes are in that probe. So for the first time in 2015, astronomers can actually map the surface of Pluto because it's so distant and so small. It hasn't been observed. And you know, you'll note one of the regions they named is Cthulhu Regio in Pluto. Although I was sad, I just recently, like very recently, this has been renamed. So it's no longer Cthulhu Regio. So unfortunately, that connection is no longer there. Uh, but it is kind of appropriate because after discovering Pluto, Clyde Tombag claims that he keeps seeing flying saucers like buzzing by him. So again, you can say maybe the aliens from uh, Yugoth are not happy with him having a. Uh, uh, spoiled, you know, their hidden world. Uh, the Whisper in Darkness is one of the first stories uh, to be about the planet Pluto, uh, which is kind of uh, appropriate. You know, the most recent uh, planet discovered before Pluto is Neptune. Lovecraft is a big fan of Edgar Allan Poe, who again lived in Providence for a while as well. Edgar Allan Poe's uh, 1849 story, Melanta Tauta, is one of the first stories to depict the planet Neptune, and I think it is the first story to depict Neptune's moons. So it's appropriate that Lovecraft gets to talk about Pluto very early, just as Edgar Allan Poe, one of the first people to write about Neptune. Uh, there are some other hypothesized planets in the solar system as well, which we don't remember today. Uh, planets like Vulcan and Phaeton that at one time were believed to be real. Now they've, they've kind of gone uh, the way of the dodo. I can talk about them if anyone's interested, but I will end up by saying, uh, even though we don't no longer have Cthulhu uh, Regio, uh, there is uh, the messenger probe that went to the other side of the solar system near Mercury, the innermost planet, uh, and one of the craters discovered by the messenger probe, uh, appropriately one of the southernmost craters of Mercury, uh, a crater that's always shrouded in darkness, so we don't really know what's at the bottom of this crater, was named Lovecraft. So there is a Lovecraft crater on Mercury, even if there's no longer a Cthulhu Regio on Pluto. Uh, so we have, you know, it's 3.52 now. I'll, I'll, wa I'll wrap it up here. But I will say, again, if anyone's interested, if you have any questions later on, you can email me there. Uh, and again, the book available directly from Hippocampus Press or on Amazon, or you can go to Lovecraft Arts and Sciences in Providence. But other than that, I'll say I'm happy to answer any questions or comments that anyone in the audience has. <laughs> yeah. So think about it, I, I know more about like the legacy of Lovecraft. That, like you see the impact on his work and it, when the people are like creating like the Lovecraftian cosmic horror, does the space part, like, how much of it is his space versus, <laughs> like, you know, other non space Lovecraft stuff and they stick it in Pluto? Like? Yeah, like, in, again, you know, one of the things that Lovecraft has a long legacy among other authors using his work, and uh, actually a very contested one after he dies, basically, one of his casual friends, like, takes control of his estate through what turns out to be fraudulent means. So there's a, there's a lot of stuff about what was allowed to be published as Lovecraft work, what wasn't. But there's not a huge, interestingly, there's not a huge amount of like, you no know, Lovecraftian space story. There's a few. Typically what will happen is you know, they'll say like, oh, this star is where this god came from. Uh, the guy who kind of took over Lovecraft's estate, August Derleth, he was really big on this. So he basically associated each of Lovecraft's gods with a certain star or planet. But in Lovecraft's notes themselves, you know, he does mention you know, certain connections between stars and planets with his uh, 
uh, creatures. And you know, once in a while, one of his stories, he will you know mention you know, certain connections that are there. Uh, so again, a lot of it does come from kind of later people, but it's it's not as widespread as I I might have thought. Uh, I will say one thing that is kind of an interesting uh, connection. Uh, one of Lovecraft's uh, close friends, Robert Block, probably most famous uh, for the guy who goes on to write uh, Psycho. Again, you know, Lovecraft had a lot of these early connections. Uh, another early connection Lovecraft had, he met a young science fiction fan uh, 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 who would go on to uh, you know, invent Scientology. L. Ron Hubbard was a Lovecraft connection early on. Uh, uh, and Lovecraft said, like, oh, this guy probably will do something with his life. Uh, but uh, which he, he did end up doing. Uh, but Robert Block, people don't tend to know much of this. He went on to write episodes of Star Trek, the original series, and Robert Block's episodes have references to Lovecraft's aliens in them. So there is a bit of Lovecraft in uh, Star Trek. Uh, another notable connection, uh, uh, a guy who worked on uh, Star Wars, Dan O'Bannon, went on to write Alien, uh, who's very connected with uh, uh, Lovecraft as well. Uh, if you ever watch Alien, Dan O'Bannon's original idea is that the planet that they find you know, the alien eggs on is supposed to be Yuggoth, that uh, uh, he takes a lot of details from Lovecraft's novel At the Mountains of Madness and incorporates that into Alien. So again, you know, there are a lot of these big science fiction franchises do have some connection to like Lovecraft's uh, outside influences, but uh, it can, yeah, it's, I think it's becoming more uh, widespread in recent years, but uh, it did take a while to kind of uh, take off. Yeah. And given what we know about the size of the uh, cosmos, how much was Lovecraft aware of the extents of this? Well, you know, our universe. Yeah, Lovecraft lived during a time when there's a lot of astronomical discovery. I mean, uh, the first moons of Jupiter since Galileo in the 1600s are discovered during Lovecraft's lifetime. A number of moons of Saturn are discovered, but also the, the notion of the size of the universe as a universe comes about uh, in 1920. Uh, that's when uh, the astronomer Edwin Hubble discovers that what was believed to be the Andromeda Nebula was actually the Andromeda Galaxy. So the idea that the universe extends beyond the Milky Way, that's discovered in Lovecraft's lifetime. The idea that the universe is constantly expanding, that comes in Lovecraft's lifetime. Uh, the notion that uh, uh, Einstein's discovery of the special theory of relativity, that comes about during uh, uh, Lovecraft's life. I mean, Lovecraft has a very, he's someone who is very interested in Einstein's work, doesn't fully understand it, but he is someone who wants to, he basically wants to understand. Interestingly enough, at the very end of his lifetime, Lovecraft basically says, oh, I don't believe in Einstein anymore. I'm going back to you know, the Newtonian universe, which is kind of an interesting kind of, you know, set. So he's very skeptical of, you know, things like UFOs, but when it comes to actual science, he does have some uh, back and forth there. But yeah, he it's during his lifetime, especially the time he's writing, when, I mean, literally the idea of the universe as a universe and not just a galaxy, a universe that's constantly expanding, these are ideas that are emerging during his time that he's keeping in touch with as well and that are influencing his writing. Yeah, Alejandro. You said I wanted to mention because I was looking for the, the short story that Jorge Luis Borges mm -hmm. wrote. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, dedicated this uh, short story more than. Is that the Aleph? Was, or yeah, a, a, he dedicated this to Lovecraft. But he, only that, he was a kind of uh, follower of uh, Poe. Mm -hmm. no? Yeah, so yeah. Is, I, but the idea is, for me, is. When I'm, I mention this is because these findings in terms of universe, you know, allow some of our Latin American uh, uh, writers or uh, philosophers to think about the uh, condition of humanity and the deep uh, faith of what is unknown. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a, a different kind of version of, uh, I would say, literary topic. The universe there allow us to know that we are not, not nothing. And we can find, according to Borges, the universe in, on Earth, when you are just walking around houses that you don't know what they contain, and the, whoever is the owner of the house, at the end, it was a monster in space. Monster. <laughs> yeah. So it was very interesting how this dialogue, in terms of uh, uh, the findings, uh, 
this research, the ideas, the uh, was it, uh, uh, was it the, the images that, that they have related to the expanding of the universe is very much related to our condition. Yeah. yeah, I'll say Borges was one of the, he's very early on as being kind of a major figure who was interested in Lovecraft, much like Edgar Allan Poe. It's actually, uh, the French are much more interested in Lovecraft as like a serious literary figure before uh, English language people are. So, uh, and then uh, a couple of years, there's a good uh, piece of scholarship a few years about kind of tracking how Lovecraft's works get translated into Spanish and when and where they get disseminated. It is, I think it's a lot, it's tied with some exiles from the Spanish Civil War. And so again, interesting network of uh, like political and international figures there. But yeah, there's been a recent uh, uh, spate of kind of a research of just when Lovecraft gets translated into different languages and when and where. Uh, uh, I mean, inter I think like, before the end of the Cold War, he's in Eastern European countries, which also is kind of in, I think Poland is one of the first big uh, Eastern Bloc countries to start translating Lovecraft. So again, it's, again he has an interesting range of uh, adoption. Uh, I was curious when you mentioned um, he was a big fan of uh, a letter writing, you know, you think you mentioned a hundred thousand letters. Were those letters combined into a book or So my book's published by Hippocampus Press. They're engaged in a, a very long-running project to uh, publish all of Lovecraft's existing correspondence. Uh, They've been, they've been doing that since, I think, at least the late 90s. I think they're planning next year to finish it up. So, I mean, there are literally dozens of volumes of uh, tens of thousands of pages combined. Like, I mean, I, I don't need, like, you can buy them, but I don't even own all because it's, it's a significant investment. But I mean, th so they are slowly making these letters published and you know, uh, annotated and available. And the difficulty is some of these letters have private owners and so, like for example, like uh, one of his main correspondents, a guy named Robert Barlow. I think the university, or uh, uh, yeah, I think it's the University of Florida owns all of his uh, writings, and so all of his letters had to get published through them. And there's certain like private owners of certain other letters. Like I, just recently, I think there's like five or six letters that got sold. Uh, uh, from a, cer a woman Lovecraft corresponded with. I mean, those letters, uh, there's a fan effort to raise money to buy those to then donate to Brown University so they could have access. I mean, it was only like, I think it was like less than a dozen letters. It was over $10,000. So again, one of the problems is there are these letters that are in private hands, but they know how much they're worth and it's just hard to get. But the vast majority of remaining letters should finish being published by Hippocampus, I think by the end of this year or next year. And, but again, it's, this is a project that's taken decades to really get a lot of these out. What about those letters that the wife <laughs> I mean, that, we, we know no. the wife burns, so like one of his other friends burned a lot, but I mean, you know, it's just, people also just kind of got rid of, you know, letters. Like no one, again, no one in the 1930s thought anyone was going to have interest in this guy. I mean, he died almost, one of the reasons he died is because his diet was so poor, because he was so poor. I mean, he talks about, you know, celebrating by eating a cold can of Chef Boy RD. I mean, that, that's the straits he's in at the end of his life. And again, part's because he had very bad business instincts. He didn't know, so, but again, no one, very, I shouldn't say no one, very few people thought he was ever going to be a, uh, uh, a big name. Probably, if they had a gleaning, they would have wouldn't have burned all those things. Or you know, there's other. They, they talk about how uh, they gave you know all these postcards he wrote to their kids to play with, and the kids ended up tearing them up and just like, whoops, <laughs> like if only. But. <laughs>